Welcome, everybody. Ohayou gozaimasu. Genki desu ka? Mina genki. <laughs> Mina genki, that's what they say on the, the television program my children watch. Mina genki. <laughs> uh, NHK at 7 o'clock in the morning. Um, so what do you think? Are you happy? Yeah? Anything exciting happened overnight? <laughs> no? Nothing to report? No? N nothing. Callistus, you must have some news. No. Nothing? <laughs> oh. All right. Um, so uh, yesterday we, we, um, we, we spoke about FFP, fabrication, welcome, fabrication, falsification, and plagiarism. Um, which in Japanese is Netsuzo, Giso, and Toyo. Is that right? Okay, I'm learning slowly. Um, so we had this sort of um, this um, mental rep representation. We've got responsible research conduct over here, and then we've got th this is the best behavior, and then we've got fabrication, falsification, and plagiarism over there. That's the worst behavior. And then we've got this piece in the middle. And, and this is the, the bit in the middle is the bit we're going to talk about today. But just to, to recap, so responsible research conduct is conducting research in the ways that fulfill the professional responsibilities of researchers as defined by their professional organization. So you, you follow the rules of your craft, yeah? Whatever the kind of expectations are, whether it's in social epidemiology or superconductors, uh, you know that you follow the rules of the of the kind that are laid down by the by the organisation. And then at the bad end, we've got this fabrication, which is making up data, falsification, which is changing data, and plagiarism, which is taking other people's work and presenting it as your own. <coughs> In the world of superconductors, is f is, is, are, are these problems? Have there been falsification? Oh, Very there's... Few, but plagiarism, there has been... A lot of plagiarism. Yeah, people are scared to share things early on. What about cold fusion? Cold fusion, wasn't that... that that's a sort of physics uh, example of, I think... That was either fabrication or falsification. I think they said they can make energy from, I don't know, from nothing or something like that, uh, using cold fusion, but they, but, but they couldn't. Still what? I'm not sure. You're not sure? That's not your area. <laughs> You're a superconductor man. <laughs> All right. So, um, so these are the misconceptions that we're talking about. The first one is that fabrication, falsification, and plagiarism are rare. Actually, I think they're much more common than we think. This one, everybody knows it's common, but they think it's not serious. And I'm going to challenge that idea. And then the idea that scientists can regulate, that we can look after ourselves, that we don't need rules because we're responsible people. Um, so we, we talked about, I showed you this systematic review of the prevalence of uh, research misconduct. And this is uh, evidence. So there are numbers. There have been several studies where they've asked researchers, have you ever conducted research misconduct? And about 2% of researchers in universities admit to fabrication, falsification, or plagiarism. And if you ask them, do you know somebody else that's done this, then it's about 14 or 15%. Yeah. So that's not particularly rare. Um, it's not particularly rare at all. And these questionable research practices, things that are not really, you know, terribly, you know, they're not the worst behavior, but they're not the best behavior, that's really common. And I was suggesting that in epidemiology, it's almost so common, it's, it's considered normal. And, um, and then we, we looked at these kind of, um, the surveys result, the prevalence I've just spoke about. So um, now I want to look at some of these questionable research practices. 
And um, um, I've, I'm the director of a clinical trials unit. I, I do clinical trials uh, all, all the time. Um, and in my, uh, my unit, we've got a lot of clinical trials on the go. And they're very simple to understand. You get a, gr a group of patients with a particular disease, and then you randomly allocate them to get the treatment or not, and then you follow the two groups and you find out about their outcomes. And I, I really like them because I find they're very easy to understand. Um, you don't have to do any fancy statistics, you know, or anything like that. You can just, um, because of this randomization process, on average, this group and this group will be the same apart from the treatment. So, the, so any difference in outcomes, you can say, is due to the treatment, yeah? Oh, I need that little thing, don't I? This thing. I don't have to keep on going back. Oh, it doesn't work. That doesn't matter. So, um, some time ago, I, I, uh, I had, with a PhD student of mine, I, I wanted to know, well, look, I do clinical trials. What do, what are the major, what are the most important sources of misconduct in clinical trials? Obviously, I wanted to avoid them, uh, but what are the, what are the, um, the major forms of scientific misconduct that have an impact on the results, you know? I mean, the, you do a clinical trial to find out about treatment effectiveness and safety. And that's, you know, that's um, all, it, all you want to know about. And so what forms of scientific misconduct will have an effect on the results of a clinical trial. So, and that's what we wanted to find out. And um, so what we did is we, we asked a group of experts in clinical trials. We, we got a group of 40 experts in clinical trials. Um, and we wrote to them and we asked them to, make a, uh, to assess two things. First, tell us, uh, tell us about where misconduct can arise in clinical trials. What kinds of misconduct are there in clinical trials? Um, and it could be misconduct in the design, in the conduct, in the analysis, or the reporting of the clinical trial. Just tell us all of, you know, all, we had a long list of all the different kinds of misconduct that can arise. And that was in the first stage. So we had two stages. The first stage is tell us about all of the forms of misconduct. The second stage is tell us about how likely they are to happen and how likely they are to affect the results. Yeah? So obviously, if something's very common and it changes the results, then that's, the mo that's more important. If it's common but it doesn't change the results, or if it's not common and it does change the results, but if it's common and changes the results, then that's what we want to know about. So, what do you think are the most important? Now, so take, take a few minutes and just write down some of your ideas about what you think in clinical trials are the most, think of, you know, two or three, the three most important forms of misconduct they are in terms of likely to occur and influence the results. Yeah? So th have, give, just t spend a few minutes thinking about that. Now, Hiro, have you got what, what do you what do you think is the most Im important? Reporting outcomes. Reporting outcomes, and what 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 sort of misconduct could happen? Okay, so after, so you, you might have a, what you think is the, pro, you start off your study saying, this is what I want to find out. 
And then you look at the data and you say, ah, there wasn't much of an effect there, but there's an effect here. This is my new primary outpoint, <laughs> yeah? Okay. So it's like um, th th they have it, you know, it's almost like um, it's called the, they, they call it the Texas sharpshooter. You know, the Texas sharpshooter um, uh, shoots bullets and then looks where they are and then, and then draws the target round it. Yeah? So it's like you see where the bullets land and then you draw the target. Yeah? And that's, um, so it's like you, you know what the results are and then you say, yes, that's my primary endpoint. Okay. Yeah, I think that's, that's an interesting point. Uh, any other suggestions? Go on, you've got one. Yes. Yeah, when we're doing the, you know, the clinical trials, this is uh, projecting of the predicted in the data. So what you're saying is very important form of misconduct is this, the one we were talking about yesterday, where they say that the trial is randomized and it's not in fact randomized. Is that what you're saying? Yes, randomization and uh, concealing and the blinding can uh, not clean. Ah, okay. Now this is a really important point because it's probably the most, uh, 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 it's the most, um, it's a difficult uh, concept in, in the area of randomized trials. Does everybody know allocation concealment? Yeah? Everybody's nodding, but often people get this wrong. Allocation concealment. Who wants to tell us about allocation concealment? Callistus, go on. Just uh, a way of ensuring that uh, the investigators don't know which group the participants have been assigned to. They don't know which group the participants have been assigned to. Okay. It's got some of it, but not all of it. Anybody want to, do you want to have a, another go? Anybody want to allocation concealment? Unpredictability. Unpredictability. Wow, that's really good. So, yeah, between you, I think you've got it. So, um, where where must the unpredictability be? What must be unpredictable? Ye yes, that's good. So it's a little bit different from what you're saying, but it's, it's, there's a lot of overlap. It's unpredictability, so that the clinician mustn't know. You, I think you said the clinician mustn't know what group the patient is in. Also, that's blinding. That's blinding, yeah. The clinician mustn't know what the next patient's going to get, yeah, in the trial. So let's 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 spend a bit a, a few moments on that. So supposing we had, because that's this is quite important. Supposing we had um, a randomized trial of a treatment to stop people from smoking, yeah. So smoking is a bad thing. Do any of you smoke? You wouldn't admit, would you? <laughs> so we, we all think smoking's a bad thing and we shouldn't do it. Um, and so, but people do, and, and so doctors might like to get people to stop smoking, right? And suppose I have a, a very, um, a new method of getting people to stop smoking, right? And I want to try my method out in, in a trial. And um, my, I, I make a sort of, uh, I don't want to rip this up, but uh, let me 
see as I can rip this up. Okay, so I, I have a sort of... Um, so I'm going to have a, a sequence, right? I've got two treatments. I've got my smoking, stopping, my stop smoking program, and that's called the, the stop program. Or I'm going to have a, a placebo pr program, yeah? So I've got a stop smoking program or a placebo program. And Callistus, could you shuffle those, please? <laughs> All right. So he's, they're completely... Ah, right, he's turned them over, <laughs> right? That, he's done more than shuffle. <laughs> he's turned it over. That was really important. So um, this has been shuffled by Callistus. It's a random order, yeah? So it's a random order, and I put it there. On, I, let's see. Let, uh, all right, I... I um, just for the sake of argument, I'm just going to move one, right? So, I, I, so I, I've got, they're reasonably sh shuffled, and there they are. And uh, now, that's my sequence in my trial, right? So I get the first patient who comes into my clinic. And he comes into my clinic, and he goes, <laughs> <laughs> and he's got this little square thing in his top pocket, you know, and I, I can see his cigarette packet, and I can see his fingers, and they're all yellow, and I can see his hair that's all yellow as well. This is just gray, this is old, uh, but you know, not smoking. But you can see the yellow in the hair, and you think, oh my goodness, this is a nicotine addict. Yeah? This guy's never gonna stop. And then you say, oh, he's going in my smoking program. I don't want him to go in my smoking program because I'm sure he's not going to stop. You know, he's been smoking for 50 years. So what do you do? Well, what you do is you say to the patient, Mr. Yamamoto, that's his name. Mr. Yamamoto, are you sure you want to take part in this clinical trial? Taking part in a clinical trial is a very serious thing. Why don't you talk to it? Why don't you discuss this with your wife first? before taking part in this clinical trial, yeah? So Mr. Yamamoto goes home to talk to his wife. And then the next patient is um, a student at Kyoto University, yeah? A young woman, she only smokes when she's drunk too much, but that can be quite often, yeah? So she, you think, right, she's a student of public health, she's not an addict, she only smokes when she's having a drink and she wants to stop smoking. And then you say, well, right, you can go into my smoking program, into my smoking program, yeah? So it, it's allocation concealment. This is unconcealed, yeah? And so as Tomomo, Tomoko, Tomoko said, it's not unpredictable, yeah? It's predictable. So because it's predictable, it's open to bias, yeah? And so this needs to be completely hidden. So I must not know uh, who's going to go into the next group until they've gone into that group. How could you do that, practically? Ask somebody else to educate them. Ask someone else to do it. You, y yes, you could ask someone else to do it. Um, but um, how would it work? How, how, how would you do that? That's right. Yeah. The best way to do it is on the f with a phone, right? So, so what, what you do is that if you want to put a patient, the patient comes in the door, <coughs> and you pick up the phone, and you call a telephone randomization service, and you say, I've got a patient here who wants to go into this clinical trial. And then the person at the other end of the phone was with a computer, and they say, tell me the information. So he's Mr. Yamamoto, he's 53, he's been smoking for 15 years, he's got this, and they're entering this into the computer. And then when all of that's classed, the, the person at the other end of the phone presses a button and say, he's in the smoking cessation group. Yeah? 
So you can't really have any control. And you can, you know, you can try to say, oh, please, can it go in the other group? But it won't work, you know, because it's just a computer uh, at the other end. So that, that works very well. So that's a really good suggestion uh, of yours. So uh, if allocation concealment is poor, that can bias, that can bias the results. So we've had two really good suggestions. We've had changing the primary endpoint, cheating on allocation concealment. Any other suggestions? From stupid suggestion, which is uh, misleading information by the providing participants. Sometimes you ask them things, and they just don't give the right uh, answer, or they just hide it or something. Mm. So uh, do you think that's common? So what we're looking for is things that are... With certain things like uh, sexual-related things. Mm. Okay, so there's a sort of, um, um, yeah, biased reporting of outcomes because of maybe embarrassment or this or that. Yeah? Okay. So um, what the experts said is we asked them two things, remember. We asked them what's very likely to ha happen and very likely to impact on the results, right? So it's very common and it changes the results. So the, f the, the, the first thing is over-interpretation of significant findings in small trials, yeah? Uh, the next thing is selective reporting based on p-values. So it it's, um, relates to the point that um, was made at the back there. Selective reporting of outcomes. Um, subgroup analysis do done without proper tests. Negative studies not published. So the things that the experts in clinical trial, things that are, are the most important, are rather not what is done, but more what is concealed, yeah? Because you know, when you, do a, when you do a study, you might collect lots of information, and then you look at it, and there's some good parts, and there's some bad parts, and actually what you do is you suppress the bad parts and emphasize the good parts, yeah? And, and that's what those, so that there is two things, if you had to summarize what they think are the most important areas, it's, it's focusing on the positive results after you know what the results are. And it's almost like using, um, it's like um, the, I don't know, if I say it in English, it'd be too complicated. Opportunistic use of the play of chance. That's a complicated thing to say, isn't it? <laughs> How would you say that more simply? Um, so it's using chance. What's chance in Japanese? Do you say chance? Yeah, you say the same. <coughs> what, what's randomness? You know, like, is there a word for it? Random. <laughs> Don't you have any Japanese words for these things? Mu? Uh, Musakui. Musakui. Oh, okay. Yeah. And that's kind of just, there's no reason for it. Just, it's just chance. Chance is really interesting. I, 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 I've, I find it's one of the simplest things, but it's, it's quite complicated to, to think about. So, um, so selective reporting and using chance uh, to your advantage. Yeah. Those, those are the things that are most um, important. And the, these are, so remember this, this bit. Here, oh, hang on, let's go way back. This, these are all these things, yeah? So when you ask experts in clinical trials, what's the most important thing? They don't say that. They think that's really bad. But it's relatively rare, right? Relatively rare. But these things are very common and very serious.